Hey guys, welcome back. This is the Deke Snipe Silly Podcast, episode 17 coming up. Uh, just me and Chad tonight, just a twosome. Yep. Uh, us. But we got a guest joining us momentarily. Uh, you've seen his work, I guarantee it. Um, and uh, I've been I've been loving on his his stuff for years, and he's he's I've actually been exposed now to some stuff I didn't know he did, um, some real serious stuff and uh, and high end quality stuff. We got Rob McDougal coming on here in a moment, and uh, and he's basically a world famous artist, uh, sports artist. So, so some great stuff, and he knows everybody. He knows everybody, and stories to boot. So without further ado, titter tatter, let's get at her. Hey guys, welcome to episode 17 of the Deke Snipe Sully podcast. Uh, tonight we're short one member, uh, Kylie was unavailable tonight, but we do have a guest to fill her spot. Uh, we'd like to welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Rob McDougall. He's an, uh, an accomplished artist and also experienced longtime lacrosse player and coach uh, in, his, in the world of art. He's been uh, commissioned by the uh, NHL, NFL, uh, Major League Baseball. To do uh, to do prints for uh, for the uh, the elite of the games, uh, mm-hmm. and of course in the lacrosse world, he's he's coached and trained uh, right on up uh, into the international level. So um, we're looking forward to a few stories from Rob on all on all sides. So welcome to the show, Rob. Welcome. It's great to have you. And this is cool. I, this is the first time I've ever actually uh, talked about sports. It's usually business uh, on these these Zoom lenses or whatever they call them. But uh, yeah. great. Uh, I'm really happy to be talking to the Newfies. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got we lots love... of Newfies up here in Ontario, and every one of them is a good, good dude. I love those guys. Yeah. yeah. We are everywhere. Uh, Newfie over today, you know. Oh, yeah. Good. We had them put in our uh, door switch, the, the brand new thing, so that you can see if your stuff's getting stolen. Yeah. Uh, I got to call him back because he put it in sideways because everybody's walking <laughs> like this when they're coming the door. <laughs> 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 but he's good he's yeah good. he came back that's the main thing yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, well, fridge, keep the fridge closed that's I, oh yeah i think we'd be remiss if we didn't start the show before we even get into uh rob and his history and, and all about you know what he's been into might as well uh make a, a shout out to how this connection got made uh rob is a is a good friend of uh the father of a friend of mine, uh, Justin Follett, this buddy of mine. He watches all of our episodes. Great dude, and uh, and you know uh, you know his father well, Rob. Yeah, his name's Ed Follett. Yeah, Ed Follett. he's a great guy. Yeah, I love that guy. You know what? You guys are noted for just dropping everything and helping people. And you know, I mean, I we can talk about the Gander thing and 9/11, but that put the whole world uh, right in. Like they were just focusing on what was going on with you and how, how mm-hmm. it was handled. I mean, up here in Ontario, um, you know, we take it for granted that you guys are part of the whole big picture, you know, like it's, yeah. like we always think that, you know, like, Hey, and another new fee on the way to Newfoundland, he runs out of money. That's why he's here. right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they wind up yep. here, but, uh, or they run out of gas, who knows? But, <laughs> All I say is, uh, yeah, it's it's a real pleasure to talk to you guys. And uh, oh, hopefully uh, I won't make it so boring that everybody's going to tune this out. I, I, hopefully not, I promise. <laughs> I don't think so. You, you've done too many cool things for it to be boring. All right. Yeah. I've seen your art my entire life, so I'm like, yeah. yeah. It's cool. It's really funny because it, I, 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 I envision being an artist as almost like it's almost like a secret identity in a sense because everyone sees your work. Certainly when you get to your level, you, your work is always seen. Everyone sees the actual image, but not always people take time to take a look at who the actual artist was who completed the print, right? Uh, and you, you tend to develop your own style over the years. And then people eventually start to clue into, okay, no, this is definitely this is definitely a, one of Rob's prints. It's got, it's, it, it reeks of his style, you know? And yeah. then, then, you, then people start to take notice to the artist as opposed to just the print. Well, we can call it an evolution, but there's a lot of screw-ups. 
mm -hmm. how I came into my style is because I kept screwing up, so I had to keep putting paint on. You know, like a lot of people will say, uh, um, that's not a true watercolor because you've got something else in there. And I go, so what? Yeah. Money. I need the money and the <laughs> to pay me. I mean, if it, if it works, I do it. So I've, I've developed a few different styles, but it's all, you know what it's all coming from? Um, deadlines. I live by deadlines. Every, every thing about this job is a deadline. And now that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of out of the, I'm, I'm still doing stuff, but I need to put self-imposed deadlines on me just to keep me, keep me focused and hot. Yeah. And make, making my own deadline. And actually, yeah. I think I'm a little nuts because I actually <laughs> play, I play the game. Like I'm going to lose the job if I don't get it done. Right. Yeah. So, well, that's a good, that's a great ethic though. Perfect work ethic. Well, I have to, I have to create my ethic if you know, yeah. I mean, I to, because that's good. Uh, truth is uh being an artist i'm alone all the time like i mean i'm married and everything but uh i'm, I'm talking like um my wife goes to work and she's in a uh, movie productions and i don't see her for 12 hours mm -hmm. some guys will say hey that's a good thing but no i mean i'm just saying that you know 12 hours yeah. gone. so i'm yeah. i'm uh i'm by myself all the time so i i i, I yell at alexa you know, I tell her to shut up, or you know, <laughs> yeah. And uh, or I'll crank up the TV in the other room, and I'll listen to uh, those old history shows, or I'll I'll pump on Joe Rogan, or you guys. Yeah. Are. In the last couple of weeks, I've been watching you guys. I oh, awesome! The, the Tim show, and there was another show. You guys were just doing a recap of the Leafs, but I could tell I was saying these guys are hard adders. Like you guys, you, you know your Leafs stuff. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. I hate using wheelhouse because I'm too. I'm an old fart. I shouldn't be using. Wheelhouse. Yeah. You guys, you guys are there. I, I really like really? listening to you. And the girl that's on your show, Kylie. Yeah. She knows her stuff. She uh, does. She really knows. Yeah. Her stuff. I don't. I don't remember her name. As a matter of fact, I had to look up DSC today because I was going. What does like a, is that discotomy or something? Then I found out was that dish. No deek. Deke, sorry. Yeah. You blew it. You had one job, up. Rob. You had one job. <laughs> yeah, oh, Deke, okay. Snape, Sally. You got it. There you go. Hey, so we yeah. should do, do you guys some t shirts. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. That's Let's talk about, we can talk about that. Man, I can, we can crank it out here, ship it down there, and then you just give them to your guests or you, you just pump it around town. So I, I think I think we, we tackle this, Chad, Chad uh, chronologically. Like, we'll start off. Let's, let's let's get talking about your your time in lacrosse because i mean obviously you knew you could draw i guess at a really young age it's not it's not like something you, you turn 30 and say oh shit i can i can draw yeah. a puppy dog um well, 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 i don't know about that i'll tell you I'll tell you what kind of happened i mean when i was like two years old um, my mom caught me with the crayons on the living room wall and i wasn't drawing uh, any mona lisa's it was no. shit all yeah. the walls and uh um you know i came from a, a scottish irish family so you know that my family got whooped but yeah, yeah. what my mom did do was she put me in the closet now we're not going to go there with artists and being in the closet okay so uh, <laughs> she throws me in the closet at three years old and she just said you stay there anytime you get the need to want to draw you go in there mister and so i did that and um uh, but my mom did notice that I was a kid that tended to curl into the corner with a piece of paper and, and start not drawing likenesses, but just drawing, just constantly drawing. And uh, um, so that's pretty much what happened. As a matter of fact, for a kindergarten class, um, my mom passed away uh, eight years ago and um, her house was full of my artwork but I pulled this off her wall. So this will give you an indication of my abilities at five years old. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> there it is, Robbie. I think it says, yeah, Robbie. They wrote it twice for some reason. I guess they didn't know which way to hang it. Yeah. That's a nice one. I guess it's, it's an upside down cat. <laughs> <laughs> you can hang it in whatever way you want. 
but you know what? That's kind of a cool thing. Is that you know when you when you your mom puts everything up, right? She looks yeah. up at you like even um, my mom actually hate to say it, but she beat up another mom from another town in a lacrosse game in the stands. <laughs> That's the kind of mom I had. You know, like uh, we were playing a Burlington team, and I'm on the floor and. This mom in the stand is yelling, kill number eight, kill number eight, kill number eight. I get to the bench and I'm thinking, uh, I'm number eight, right? I'm thinking, I'm yeah. number eight. What's going on? So I get to the bench and I'm asking a question to the guys going, did you hear that mom? And I said, watch, <laughs> my mom had the woman in it. And, and she's <laughs> giving her one of those, right? So I love it. You know, so my mom always <laughs> supported me everything. Like when I was yeah. doing my, my drawings at home, it was never saying that's a piece of shit. She'd always go, "That's wonderful!" Like, "Wow, you you actually did that!" And you know, it, it pumps your own it pumps your. Of course. And, but the real uh, when it really started to come together was in grade two when I did a drawing of somebody in the class, and then a kid asked, like, my first paying job was a dime. I got ten cents to draw a kid. I think his name was Danny Mills, and. Uh, but that was in my mind. I was going, wow, you know, people are coming to me. Yeah. And I, I'm only like 70 years old. So, but I'm, I got to be honest with you. I didn't really, I wasn't one of those guys that drew constantly. I was out with every other kid doing things, dirt bombs and uh, killing suckers, you know, those yeah. fish in the water. I mean, we were kids. We were, we were badass kids. Like, we would climb a tree and a kid would cut the tree down and we'd fall with the tree. I mean, that's weird yeah. stuff for uh, us to create, but we did it. Though. Yeah. You know, right. As long as you came home when the lights came on, you were good. But when I got to uh, grade eight, that's when I was really capturing likenesses. And, but I still wasn't a hundred percent in, I wasn't committed because I love my hockey. I love my lacrosse. I love my mm -hmm. friends, but they never really knew that I was, I was one of those guys that when I got home, I would draw, there's a television show called Perry Mason. I, I don't know why, but I was compelled to draw Raymond yeah. Burr and all those actors. And, um, but I was capturing likenesses. By the time I got to grade nine, I found the programs that they had in the classrooms were bullshit. Uh, you had okay. a teacher that didn't know how to draw. And she's trying to teach us. We, I remember in grade nine, we had to do a paper mache fish to hang on the lights. And I'm thinking, I am out of here. You know, I was in the yeah. I was in a smoking pit more than I was in the arts. So <laughs> everything, well, my my marks will tell you that I wasn't doing well. So, and here's the, the coup de grace was in grade 12, I failed grade 12 art. Oh, no way. Yeah, we had a real go-to, me and the teacher. I called her a fucking bitch. Oh. But, but um, this, I'm really jumping ahead here, but in 2005, <laughs> I got inducted into my high school Hall of Fame. And in 2005, she's sitting in the seats, and this is like 30 years after the crime was committed, right? So yeah, that's right. Seat, so when I got up on stage to do that, you know how yeah, and I was actually the very first one to be inducted. And so I was the one who set the bar when you went on stage, which is wrong if you've ever streaked to school. You know, you're not supposed to talk about stuff like that. So I uh, I don't know if you know what a streak is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be no streaking on this episode. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I her name was um uh, her name was Briar back in high school, but she got remarried. So she actually found another guy, which I found shocking. But anyway, she found his, <laughs> his name. Was, uh, his name, she, she introduced herself. She says, do you remember me? And I says, how can I forget Mrs. Bird? She says, my name is not Mrs. Briar anymore. It's Mrs. Bernhardt, right? I said, oh, great, great. So I get up on stage and I'm, sit, I'm telling the kids, I said, I got to tell you guys something. I failed grade 12 art and I was in Mrs. Hartburn's class right <laughs> and uh you should have heard the room I'll start laughing because <laughs> I, messed, I messed up her name but I don't know if I did it on purpose but 
Anyway, <laughs> I did tell the kids that, uh, you know, it took 30 years, but the truth is, I was wrong. I wasn't dedicated to what I was doing. And you know what? I was doing that in every class because I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. And everybody in this auditorium right now, I can guarantee half of you in here don't know what the hell you're going to do. Yeah, that's right. And the truth is, I didn't go to art school until I was 23 years old. So between high school and that time, I did a lot of reality checks. You know, I was working on pipelines and I was in a roofing business and I mean, I was slugging hard, you know, so uh, that's pretty much tells you that um, I never really actually said I'm in until I decided to go to Ontario College of Art in Toronto. And this is, I remember I had to go for an interview. I guess, I I guess it's going to sound like I wasn't in, but I was in a roofing, I was roofing that day. I had a, uh, an interview for 11 in the morning. Uh, buddy dropped me off in the truck and I got tar all over my arms. Like, you know, like when you're shingling, you get those little black ticks. So I'm covered in the ticks. I'm wearing one of those uh, uh, Gilligan hats and um, my artwork slapped in between um, two for sale signs, you know, the houses. I stole a couple of boards off of yeah. Mm -hmm. like a century 21 or something. And I put my stuff in there and I, I remember walking into this place and the, the room was full of all these people with suits on and these alligator portfolio cases. Like they were looking like, and I'm walking in looking like Fred, Fred Durf, right? <laughs> yeah. So I sit down and I'm going, oh, you did say you wanted to do this. So you better stick at it. And there's something that I learned in roofing. I'll tell, I'll tell you what happened. So I finally, my name's called, I go sit down. I got to sit with these three guys and they're, they're, um, they're instructors and they're looking at me. I'm kind of looking at them, wondering what they're all about. Cause you know, there's a variety of people in the art program that are kind of funny looking, but, uh, and I'm sitting there because I'm a hockey lacrosse guy. Nobody else was sports thinking. So I'm sitting there and they open up my, uh, my for sale signs and they're looking at all these pieces that I did. And they would look at each other and then look at me and then um, they walked away and did, did a little huddle and they came back and sat down and they said, listen, you know, you've got good drawing skills, but if you come back next year, I think you'll be ready then. And I went, no way. I'm going to see you this September. And I didn't say another word. I just said, I'm going to see you in September. And I just made eye contact with the guy that I thought was the poobah. And he was the poobah. So I just yeah. kept looking at him. And he kept looking at me. And he started doing these. And then he says, you know what? A guy like you would be really helpful in, in this program because of the way you are. And you're probably going to help other students. And so I think you're going to get it this year. So what do you think, guys? We let them, yeah. So it was almost like that show, The Voice, or that other thing. But but back in those days. So so yeah. all of a sudden now I'm in. So uh, I I remember after my first month of school, I'm in a class of thirty. There are ten classes with thirty. So there are oh, sorry, how many? There's three hundred sixty kids. I don't know, thirty six kids. But I remember after my first month, just doing a self analysis. I sat there. I'm going so. I got 36 kids in my class and I got myself ranked in my class right now out of 10. I'm a three. Now, if I'm oh, yeah. a three out of 10 with 360 kids, I'm screwed. Like yeah. at some point you do, you got to make the commit. You got to actually tip, dip your toe into it and get ready to it. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's when I made the commit. And I had about 20 grand in the bank because of all the money I made in the summer from roofing because it's good money. And I said, you know what? It's time to buy some books. I remember scouring Queen Street in Toronto, which is one of the book districts in Toronto, everything district, actually. Yeah. And I remember buying books, everything. And not many words in those books, guys, just pictures. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I just, I just got so um, into it. 
you know, I go and buy an airbrush, a $200 airbrush, and I, I broke it because I, I let it sit outside the reservoir and it dried out and it sealed up tight like a bug's ass. So I, I couldn't couldn't use it anymore. Okay. So I, that was a waste of 200 bucks, but I, I went and bought another one. And I learned There's more wisdom. Well, I call, I don't know if you can see this in the background, but I learned this. If you keep your airbrush submerged in the water at all times, it's like yeah. a creature from the Black Lagoon, right? <laughs> I just drop them in there. And it's, I mean, I use them for 10 days and all of a sudden I need them. And you yeah. know what? He's back in business. It's Perfect. Cool. And, uh, wisdom. Know, yeah. It's, wisdom. But, but, it's, but it's, it's also, you know, some guys are fastidious. Mm. I'm like, I'm like, uh, you wouldn't want to see me in a kitchen because it's everywhere. And yeah. I'm like, when I draw and paint, at the end of the day, it takes me a day to clean up sometimes, you know? But anyways, when I, um, so I started at art school, I ranked myself, I committed, and then your competitive juices from all your years of competition sits in and you go, you know what, I'm better than that guy over there. Or here's the other thing I used to do. When I went to drawing classes, I, you know, you can walk around the room and see what everybody's doing. So you size up. So it's almost like sitting again with the smartest guy in chemistry. So you sit beside him and you, you're checking out his nomenclature. And he might be cheating a bit, but but at art school, if you're sitting beside the best kid in the class who's drawn a certain way, and you're sitting beside him and you're trying to copy it, it's cool. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, it's the world of cheaters at art school. Oh, absolutely. We all cheat because we all have our heroes and we try to emulate them, but... That's what I did. I always sat beside the best kid. And I did that for like, we had a four year program, but at the end of the fourth year, I went from a three to basically those guys who's ever listening uh, from OCA days. I was around at eight, eight to 10 in there because we were, we were very, very competitive for the, we had a 10 artists that were cranking out some really, really good stuff. But the reason why they were is because the competitive instincts kicked in and it's so important and and it was um yeah in my last year they actually gave me an award for something completely different they wanted me to become okay. an art director and okay they thought that my career would be in art direction and i um, i went for like what my prize was was a job so i went for the job interview and they told me uh that I was going to be doing this, I'm going to be doing that. You're going to be a go for this, go for that, that kind of guy. And uh, and I kept on saying, so and uh, how much am I going to get paid? Why do you keep asking that question? I said, well, I, I kind of got to know. You know. Yeah. They said, well, you'll be working 65 hours a week. God. In your in your to one year, and you'll be mm -hmm. making thirteen thousand five hundred. Oh wow. And I went, fuck, because <laughs> because. That January, like the, yeah. go back the clock five months, we had a surprise birthday party for me in this January, and we surprised everybody at the party by getting married. So I married my art school girlfriend. Okay. And, uh, so then she informed me that she had no dough. Right. <laughs> so I had to, I had to carry the load. So I went to my teachers and I said, "Listen, can I take?" Um, real job situations bring them into you and you guys can market and i can use as an assignment for the school but it's money it's a real paying job and they, they actually said yes and trust me i got a couple of b's one c i'm wow. gonna see so that lets you know that it'll do comes in again right so yep. but in from that january to that may meeting with that guy offering me thirteen thousand five hundred, i already made eighteen thousand dollars from January to that time, just okay. doing things, and, and it was great. I, 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 but then I, I'm sitting there going, so I'm going to give up all this stuff that I know that I could probably make 100, 200 grand a year at some point in time, or I'm going to start at 13.5. And yeah. so let's roll the clock forward. The person that was the runner up for that prize, I think she's in second in command in New York. Uh, at an advertising agency, she makes about five hundred thousand a year. Whoa. So, good call. See, <laughs> I 
Is that wisdom too? Or <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no, but truth is at that, you know, you know what it's like at that very moment in time, it yeah. just wasn't yeah. right for me. So you know, yeah. it's not like hockey yeah. players, they get sent to a team, they hate the experience, and it's not right for them, but they gotta stay there. I, we don't we don't have to be that way, right? So no, anyways, no. I kind of given you a um, like uh, Cole's notes of uh, how I got into it and how it evolved. But um, um, yeah, like my first, my first year out of school, I mean, obviously I'm a married guy. And um, uh, I think if you want to hear numbers, I think I made, made 34, no, I made 38,000 that year, year altogether, 38,000. Then I went to 67. Then it doubled. And then I actually, uh, when I got an agent in New York City, that's when things got crazy. So, okay. But uh, yeah, but everything I did, oh yeah, yeah, we, I forgot, I did work at the Toronto Sun too. So I mean, I'm kind of all over the map. Control me. Yeah. That's good, that's man. Right. We got the background that covers the art side of things. There's one thing you missed that I want to talk about though. Let's roll right into the mixture of art and hockey. You spent, uh, I won't say a significant amount of time. You spent a couple of years working for Don Cherry on the Grapevine, and uh, and you were doing their their character work there, right? Yeah, I, um, I actually graduated that summer, and um, I wanted to do. I heard Don Cherry was going to be writing a book, and I actually sent him samples of my work. I found out uh, where his office was, and I sh- sh- sent them out. And I remember the night coming home and get my answering machine and and it went hello there rob this is don cherry and i was like Holy <laughs> shite. it worked <laughs> yeah so hey he said i really really like your work and i want to meet with you and everything like that so i wound up meeting with him but he also brought a guy named jerry patterson and jerry patterson was his uh, his agent and um basically Jerry, I'm not going to say Jerry made Don Cherry the Don Cherry he is. Like Don Cherry evolved with the suits and everything, but it was all through the encouragement of Jerry Patterson, right? But so Jerry um, asked me if I'd be interested in doing caricatures on their television show called The Grapevine, and it was uh, taped in, in Hamilton. We had two tapings a day, so we had two guests, and uh, I think we. I think we had 15 shows because I, re- I remember having to bang out so many of these uh, caricatures in a hurry, full colors. And um, one of the things Don Cherry said is that, you know, we're not paying you enough. We know that. But so why are you signing your name this small? He says, sign that sucker this big <laughs> on your artwork so everybody gets to know who you are. Right. So yeah. I did. And then, then he said, don't do chicken scratch. People need to know who you are, you know? So he says, develop a name that everybody can read. So actually, if you look at my name, it's, you know, sure, I use I use lowercase, uppercase and everything, but you can read McDougal, but he gave me a real, like, he was a, he was a coach. Like, with me, he was a coach. And uh-huh. sometimes I didn't like him. But I know he didn't like me either because there's a few things we, we were we had, we crossed swords with. But that that we had an ongoing relationship, and uh, I always respected Don. And so I accepted to do the show, and I'm going to do two of these a day. And honestly, it, it's like when you're new at doing the caricature stuff, uh, you really had to. Um, really had to be resourceful to, to make it work because if you screw up, you got to find other ways to do it, right? So uh, um, one show I had to do Walter Gretzky and I had Walter Gretzky, uh, I did the caricature, but I had a full grown Wayne Gretzky sitting on his lap, but I, I made it smaller so they would fit. And I had cool. Walter giving him pointers and I had Walter's old Brantford um, jacket and sitting in a chair and, and Wayne looking, you know, tentatively at his dad. And at the end of the show, uh, Walter uh, comes up to me and says, 
can I buy that caricature of me and Bill Wayne? And I went, no, no. I said, let's do a barter. He goes, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want a tour of your house in Brantford, and I'll give you the original. Oh, cool. He went, really? You'll do that? And I went, yeah, I'll do that. And so we set up a time. And I remember it so well because it was Ash Wednesday. It was actually okay. you know, Pancake Tuesday, and then you had Lent. Yeah. And the, the Gretzky's are Catholic. And so Walter decided, like, he was one of those two packs a day guy, right? So he decided to go off the sticks, you know, and uh, I showed up to his place and he was having meltdowns because he wanted a cigarette. So right? oh, his, no wife, his wife was a two, two pack a day, right? So she's, she's blowing darts right in his face. <laughs> and he, he's freaking out and he just told me, go downstairs and look yourself, right? Like, so oh, yeah. I literally walked downstairs to this basement and then he finally came down because I think he snuck a dart. <laughs> didn't want to look at that to me. Kind of nerves. We're downstairs and uh, I'm just looking around. They got, honestly, they had the biggest ass TV I've ever seen. Like it was one of those uh, roll down screens, but it was like oh, yeah. nine to 10 feet long. And you know, those ceiling, uh, those yellow, red and purple lights. Yeah. Everything was sent to, uh, to uh, Walter from Wayne so we could watch all the, like, this is the guy, only guy in Ontario is watching um Wayne Gretzky hockey in, in Edmonton you know and they got yeah. satellite dish like I'm telling you it was it was huge like the world's biggest satellite dish it looked like something out of Houston you know like uh, <laughs> for for NASA and uh, but I go into the laundry room and there's a uh, there's one of those little mini tro you know when you win the art truck Art Ross trophy they give you a mini art Ross trophy yeah and if you win the lady bing you get a you know so this basement is covered with everything. And there's an art roster, but there's dirty underwear on top of it because it's in the other <laughs> room. Now, like, I'm sitting there going, right, you know, art roster, that's, that's insane, right? Like, she paid for it <laughs> on your trophy. So <laughs> I, I talked to uh, Walter, and Walter was talking about, um, yeah, we're going to have to put this stuff in uh, some place somewhere. But yeah, coincidentally, uh, the Bitoff brothers, who actually were the original owners of the Raptors, they opened up the Wayne Gretzky restaurant in Toronto. Yep. Basically, usurped the whole basement and moved it over to the restaurant. So, um, oh, you know what? This is what Walter gave me. This is oh. one of Wayne sticks. Oh, one of the classic Titans. The only problem with this stick is that it was autographed. You can't even see it. Like I, I mean, you're not going to see it, but it says it says Wayne Gretzky on here. But uh, the whatever ink he was using back in 1985 just faded away. Uh, no. So I have to, if I ever ever cross paths with uh, Wayne again, I'm going to tell him he's got to re-sign it. For me. Yeah, fresher. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll get a chance to meet him again. So that the the, um, the Walter experience was kind of fun and I you know I wound up going in, into his golf tournament because um, one of his uh, celebrities failed to show and I'm not a golfer honestly like if if I was a golfer I'd want full contact like if you take more than three swings I'm taking you out you should be able to <laughs> take body to somebody who's doing that same with curling there's got to be a, a line there where it's a free-for-all you can you can step into a guy you know? that's right yeah like, let's change things up so Sorry. He throws me into this golf tournament. I'm in a tournament with Rocky Saggy Nuts. Remember Rocky? Oh, sorry, Rocky Saginuck. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in there with Rocky and um, somebody from a rock band. I remember, uh, oh, yeah, and, uh, Todd Bertuzzi was in our group too. And by the ninth, ninth hole, Rocky wanted to rip the phone out of this uh, rock star's hand because we were always getting delayed. And I, I, I know in go golf, you've got a crew right behind you. You got a crew in front of you. Yeah. The guy was screwing things up. It was, it was pretty intense with uh, Rocky. He was a good guy, but I could tell <laughs> super pissed off. And then he, he had a deal with me, which was like best ball because, you know, uh, you know, the dick out rule. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 
get rid of the meal all the time. So, uh, yeah, so one of the things that happened on the show one day, and I don't know why Don did it, but I was just sitting in the crowd with everybody, and then all of a sudden, uh, Jerry Patterson comes up to me and says, Don wants you at the bar. And I went, why? I've got a T-shirt on. He said, no, no, no. He, he just wants to throw, throw something at you. you know? And I went, okay. And he says, oh, oh, oh by the way, uh, don't say anything. And I'm thinking, well, why would I? Like, I'm just going to stand at the bar. He says, no, no, no. He says, the reason why is because if you say something, we got to pay you because it's part of the, the legals. And I'm going, okay, no big deal. So I get to the bar and I'm leaning there and the show starts and out walks Grapes and he starts rolling with it. Hey, welcome to the Grape Bond. And I, hey, I got my buddy over there, Red Story. And hey, hey, there's my good buddy, Rob McDougall. Yeah, he's my heart and everything. Hey, Rob, how you doing? And I looked at him and I went, you know this, this is going to cost you. <laughs> they, had to stop the, they had to stop the taping and then do it all over again because, because there yeah. was that pregnant pause because I was sitting there going, with everybody, fake audience drinking fake beer and they're all waiting for me to say something. So I, I had to say something, right? Oh, yeah. But it was great. I, I wound up doing uh, uh, the show for two years and uh, I, I was talking to Ryan about this the other day, but I, I kept some of my um, originals and I don't know why, but they just got stored away. And uh, uh, when Dale Howarchuk, he was one of our guests on the show, he never got the original. I never did a deal with them. I don't know. I, I don't even know if I was at that show. I just remember getting stuff there. But um, so what they did with my caricatures is that when you go to the commercial, that's when they'll drop in the image and they'll show Walter Gretzky with Wayne. And then they go to the Canadian tire commercial or whatever it is. And then when they come back, they show it again. And then they go to the, the scene where the guys are sitting there getting interviewed. So um, I wound up with the Dale Howard check. It was in my drawer for since 1985. And, wow. but when I heard that, you know, Howard Chuck was going through the cancer and, um, he was uh, actually doing well at the time, but Sportsnet did a, a podcast with him from his, uh, his home in Orangeville. And he had just rang the bell for his last chemo. And, you know, they, they were doing exactly what we're doing here. And it was great to see him because he was, he was upbeat and he felt that he had it. And the guys who uh, were interviewing him were really pumping his tires and, it was a really feel good thing. And I remember going downstairs and I dug out that picture and I have a picture framing business in my basement because I learned that picture framers make more money than I did. So <laughs> I decided to join. Yeah. Them. So every time I do a piece of artwork, I go downstairs, frame it and ship it out. But I actually framed up the way the, the Dale Howard Chuck. I wrote a little letter on the back where this came from and the whole story and how I was supporting and all that. And I had a, a friend of mine named Frank Carnavelli, who uh, was on the uh, Barry Colts at one time as a coaching staff. So he knew Dale Howard. Right. He gave me Dale Howard Chuck's uh, uh, address. Daily information. So I sent it. And you know how you just send stuff and just you forget about it, right? Yeah. So I got a phone call. So I had Ryan listen to it yesterday, but uh, uh, cool. Dale sent me a, um, a really warm, Thank you for um, the uh, painting that I, I sent him. Hey, Rob, uh, Dale Howard, uh, call. Hey, I just wanted to call and say thank you for the caricature. Uh, I know it came through uh, uh, Frank Carnavelli, but uh, anyways, uh, just wanted to reach out and say I uh, appreciate it very much. And uh, it's well done. And uh, um, if you want to call me back, this is myself, 919. But yeah, it was a really nice, and he told me to give him a call, and I didn't. Oh, you never. Just, well, you know what? I, I, I kind of yeah. did. You know, it's all right. I, I knew he needed, uh, because I knew that he was still in a battle. And honestly, three weeks later, he passed away. 
Oh no! Way. So that's yeah. what happened. It was one of those really fast things, and uh, I I do regret not picking up the phone just to say, "Hey, man, glad to know you're doing well." They just to do that, and I, I just thought I'm gonna leave him alone because he's got yeah. enough on his plate. I don't want to regurgitate this. It was a nice gesture, and let's just do that, and and that's that's pretty much in a nutshell how that worked. Yeah, yeah that's all right. It's a really nice gesture. That's something that, like, they, that's a, such a rare piece for him that he probably forgot about since 1985. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bring something back like that to a guy that's uh, going through what he was going through. I'm sure that was well appreciated. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Oh, I hope I'm sure it was. I know his wife will have it. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, any any memories? Uh, any memories worth sharing? I guess from your time at the Sun. I mean, that's that's the large portion of your career. Anything that, that sticks out in your memory that does like, wow, I, can, I was surprised to be part of that or be in, in the vicinity when that happened? Well, it's interesting how I got in there is um, there used to be a, a cartoonist group. And uh, well, kind of a funny thing happened uh, with another artist. Uh, his name was Ted Michener and he was a caricatures too. And uh, one night he said, I got something for us to do. We're, we're going to have some fun doing it. And I said, well, what's that? And then he, he says, we're going to go to the Beverly Tavern and we're going to, we're going to drink for free all night. And I'm thinking, he says, yeah, we're going to do caricatures of people for a beer. Let's, let's give it a go. So we go into this <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm drawing people and getting beers and obviously I'm pounding them back as I'm going. Yeah. And you know, your drawing gets a little, you know, I'm sure it's like driving. So it's like steering your pencil, right? So I remember um, very well, this, this is another wisdom thing. I drew this guy with a leather jacket on, cut off sleeves, but he had this nose. It's kind of like <laughs> one of them kind of noses. And I'm looking at it going, oh, I'm going to eat this guy, <laughs> man. This is going to be awesome, right? So... I sat there and drew it and turned it around and I showed him the picture thinking it's going to be beer time. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> I knocked right on my ass. Like right past the teacup, my papers, everything. Right? And he was a big dude, right? So there was nothing I could do. But you know what the valuable lesson was? Mm -hmm. And when I do caricatures of people, when I can go medieval on you, I lay off because honestly, I just know that people already know that they got a big nose or they got fat lips or yeah. big ears. they don't need to have a telecast or tele broadcast. But the truth is you're standing here and you're asking me to do it, but boy, did he ever ding me? Like I got dinged. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> funny because Ted Michener was on the other side of the bar, giving me a thumbs up while I was trying to, <laughs> get up like this but, but the lesson that i learned was um don't totally annihilate a person yeah. and i do see a lot of caricatures out there because i'm on facebook and i've loaded up with all the people and there are some really cruel things people are doing to really gift like good talented actors and actresses and they're giving them yeah big huge chins and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not saying i'm not guilty of doing that because there are times that you can pick a most beautiful woman and try to draw that. Well, what's the feature that really jumps out is that I want to jump her, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's caricature as well as it's meant to have a bit of a, yeah. a side of humor to it. So you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you're sitting there, expect something. Yeah. So right. anyways, from that, Ted tells me, he says, you know what? Um, they just started a cartoonist club and once a month, everybody gathers like artists, like cartoonists, caricatures, they join and have this lunch together, but you're supposed to bring your portfolio, you know, bring pictures, show pictures. It's more or less, you know, glad handing. Hey, how you doing? Please meet you, blah, blah, blah. I'm, yeah, and I'm this, I'm that. So I go to this uh, lunch and a guy named Andy Donato, who has been the, um, the cartoonist at the Toronto Sun, he's actually still there. He's like 80, four years old and he's still drawing the cartoon for the Toronto Sun. Oh, wow. And God love him for that. 
And I know why he's still working there till he's 84. You know, and he got to pay support payments. <laughs> yeah. Years old. So, but anyways, he yeah. saw my work. Lots. And um, what happened was about a month later, I get a call from Andy saying, listen, um, I'm going away for four weeks to Italy to see my family and everything like that. And um, we need a cartoonist to fill my spot for the Sunday uh, sun. And I'm going to be the sports or no, the political cartoons. I'm like political cartoons. Yeah. Cartoonists like, uh, like politics. I don't like politics. And I'll tell you why I don't like politics because if a politician makes a mistake like Trudeau, they get their hands slapped, you know, in hockey. If you trip a guy, you get two minutes, right? Uh, There's a, that's a life. Thing. So, Anyways, so I had to kind of fake it for four weeks. So the four weeks gets through and I'm like, wow, I'm glad I, I pulled this off. Like I only had to come up with one idea a week, but I pulled it off. Then all of a sudden Donato phones me from Italy saying, now we're going to spend another three weeks. So they said, you're on for another three. That was grueling. But it was the best thing that happened because a guy named Hugh Stewart, who was in the sports department, was developing the um, he was on the uh, Sunday Sun, but they were about to start the Saturday Sun. So they were actually running the paper seven days a week. Sports cartoons. And I went, sure. There was only one, one cartoon a week on a Saturday. 125 bucks. That's it. And um, so that's pretty much how it happened. Um, you know, like in the beginning, we had to, uh, there are things that I didn't like was that I'd have an idea and it'd be kiboshed as soon as I come in the door. I had right. to do their idea. Well, and it's not really uh, their fault. It's just that they wanted to use their idea. And they also had the power to tell you that you're going to use this idea. Or what do you do? You just quit, right? So That's I... Right. I put up with it. There are times where we had a couple of committees and I'm thinking, you know what? The reason, the reason they have too many letters in the word committee for a very reason that that's why committees just don't work because there's just too much to yeah. everybody wants to make sure that they get the idea. Ah. But the yeah. best thing that ever happened to me was uh, uh, Scott Morrison got the editor's job. And he jumped in. I remember going into his office saying, so are we going to have a meeting? I'm sitting there thinking, I'm going to have to sit with this guy. And he goes, no, nah, no, nah, we're good. I said, so, no, nah, no, nah, we're good. We're good around. You just go do what you do. If you ever hear from me, you'll know. You'll know that something's wrong, right? So that's how <laughs> So, yeah, that was the, like, Scott Morrison was the best thing that happened to me. Just the fact that he... He just said, "Hey, you know what you're doing," and I like the way that he handled things. Uh, you know, I, he's the type of. I think the reason why he's gotten where he's gotten is because he's he's one of those guys who can motivate you just by giving you the free reign. And That's right. uh, he was Give always good rope. with his guys, uh, and he did move up the ladder. I think he's with Sportsnet in yeah. the in the top office. Same thing with uh, the hockey news. I was doing the the cartoons for the hockey news. Uh, the very, I remember I sent something to uh, the editor and I didn't know who the editor was. His name was uh, Bob McKenzie. So I send this thing to Bob McKenzie. I get a call from him. So I have to drive up to Don Mills with my portfolio showing my work. And it was like a Monday afternoon and he's like three years older than me. And his head was this big too. So <laughs> that's, that's great. So he's sitting there. And uh, he's going through my stuff. But as he's going through uh, my artwork, I look over his shoulder and he's got a lacrosse stick. He's got a lacrosse stick in the corner and it's got a ball in it. And I, I'm a lacrosse guy. I was a, like, I went all the way to major, uh, finished with the Brampton Excelsiors in 81, 81, yeah. But anyways, uh, he's got the lacrosse stick in the corner. And now all of a sudden he says to me, um, can you do a cartoon for Wednesday? And this is Monday. And I went, sure. 
we, and so we talked about it and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So I did the cartoon, got there on Wednesday, but I brought my lacrosse stick. So I come into his office and I, I hand him the thing and I said, care to play catch? <laughs> so literally, you know, all you guys would sit in those little petition foam things that keeps all the silence out. Yeah. Um, look at the hockey news. It was just full of those little islands everywhere. And there's, there's uh, Mackenzie running down the lane there, and I'm firing passes to him all over everybody's heads. We're, we're doing this in the office, and a really low ceiling, but we, him and I, we had such a <laughs> it forced uh, It forced a life, like I was talking with uh, Mackenzie this morning, and I mean, we still remain good buddies, and uh, but I also said that I played hockey with Bob Mackenzie too, and he's like the black hole. If you pass him the puck, You'll never see it again, ever. You know, <laughs> sorry, that's my beef with McKinnon. Other than yeah. that, the good dude, but don't pass it. Uh, I gotta love it. Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> He'll probably tell you I'm a shit hockey player, so I was like, <laughs> someday when Bob yeah. retires from TSM, we're gonna get him on. I've always wanted yes. to Bob. He's <laughs> as I grew up watching, and oh, watch the f bombs, boys. Yeah. that's allowed yeah. it's podcasting it's part of the charm it's podcasting yeah. <laughs> um well i guess with that i mean uh, you you talked about lacrosse briefly there and and, and your very very short coles notes version of your own career so obviously we, we ran a trailer for the episode we included the story about what that combined yourself and john Tavares. um uh, mm-hmm. and uh, i'd just like for you to, to kind of recap uh johnny's coming up through the system and and your relationship with him over the years as a coach so this would have been um 1997 i was coaching peewee peewee is 11 and 12 year old kids Mm. uh johnny tavera showed up from my trial eight years old (laughs) yeah but you see the name John Tavares. There was another John Tavares, and he Uncle John, yeah, pretty good lacrosse player. Yeah, probably, probably the best in the world, in my opinion, because he brought mm-hmm. so many elements to the game that made the game better. Yeah. So, like John Tavares, the big Johnny was was uh, an amazing player, broke all the records. But and little Johnny was an aspiring big Johnny. He wanted to be just like his uncle and. Mm-hmm. I never, never saw kids so consumed with wanting to get better at, at eight years old. So, you know, uh, I was coaching with Troy Cordingly, who was an, also a pro. And by the way, I think he was John Tavares' best man in Bercy Vicey. So Troy oh. Cordingly was uh, um, coaching with me that year. And Troy just said, let's just see what the kid can do. It'll keep his uncle happy. Uh, but I'm thinking, wow, man, he's eight years old running with 11 and 12 year olds. I mean, some kids had hair on the chest, right? Yeah. And he's like eight years old. So we let him on the floor and he was good. He was like better than average. He was, he had a better stick than 10 and 11 year old kids on, on our team. Um, and he was smart with the ball. He was slow though. He was really slow. Like we used to joke about him. We used to say that on his way to school, he got jumped by two snails. And when the cops <laughs> arrived, the, the cops said, "What happened, Johnny?" He said, "Oh, it, it happened so fast. I don't know." <laughs> so, but anyways, he was out there on the floor. Every time that he got the ball, he did things good. He just did the yeah. right things. And, but here we are. We're dealing with this guy and this, right? You got a little kid this big and guys this big. So. When it started getting closer towards the ends of the trials, uh, the president of the organization said, you're not thinking of what you're, you're not going to sign John. Like, you're not going to sign him to a P card. And I go, well, uh, he's looking pretty good. So you can't do that. It's going to upset everything. And I went, you know what? Look at the team I've got. Like, we had a really good team. And we had some big boys. I said, see that big guy over there? His name's Garrett Ince. I said, he's going to look after little Johnny if he makes the team. <laughs> and so they were adamant that don't don't sign Johnny. Yeah. So what I told them what I was going to do is I'll tell you right now. If, if uh, I'm going to pit Johnny against 
this this kid here because this kid here is uh, 10 years old or 11 years old he he's going to be my last guy to make the team or it's going to be Johnny so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put Johnny and I'm going to put this kid together in every drill so we had what we call loose ball drills and it's basically you throw the ball in the corner and whoever gets the ball wins that's just the idea it's yeah. just just it's little drills uh catching drills checking drills shooting drills um agility and things like that johnny beat the kid on every one of them so troy and i looked at each other and says well i'll be be prepared for this shit hitting the fan now because we just find him right and yeah. so we had to go in front of these this committee and yeah we said look we will look after johnny and we'll give it so what i did was the strategy in lacrosse when you got a little guy like that you want to put him closest to him because because if he loses the ball it's not going to hurt your team because you got something to back him up if he's playing at the top like the blue line in hockey shooting from there and he loses the ball it's a breakaway and the kid gets you know, he gets shit from the coaches. So right. the best way to protect a player like Johnny was to keep him low. And I put my biggest guy, which was Garrett Ince. Garrett Ince was a man. Like he could buy a case of beer at 12. You know, and like, so <laughs> I hope his mom didn't hear that. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so, um, there were a lot of moments where Johnny got run. He did get run from behind. And, um, but Garrett, Garrett being Garrett killed those guys. That's, oh, no, I, you know what I mean? He yeah. pulled the Simmons, you know? Hey, hey yeah, that's right. Poof. And, yeah. and I told Garrett, I said, don't worry about taking the two minutes, the four minutes, because we need to tell that other team that, yeah, you can take a little run at him all you want, that little guy, but we're going to answer. So we yeah. had to throw in intimidation to protect Johnny, to allow Johnny to actually do it. But you know what? I think he finished like six in our team scoring that year and he was eight years old now he was eight years old going on nine so when our season finished in august he would turn nine in september so he was always there right but we also had you know when you it's like a family like sibling rivalry when you like we had uh johnny's cousin was his older cousin was on our team and he was a bastard like his brother, his cousin Ryan was a bastard. He did stupid oh, hey. things. Like he grabbed Johnny by the head and fart on his head. <laughs> that, you know, doing stuff like that because Johnny couldn't defend himself because yeah. Ryan was so big. And I'm not just, I'm not kidding. This this kind of stuff happened. There was one time I went in the dressing room and I found Johnny in the garbage can and his feet were touching the <laughs> like this and he couldn't get out and he was crying, right? Oh, I, had, I literally had to throw the garbage can on its side to get him out but i gave i gave the player shit saying what happens if this kid gets hurt like he's our yeah he's on our team this is long before we realized that he could play hockey i mean i'd i'd heard rumors that he was a real beast in hockey too but I yeah. had never, i'd never gone to see him play but um i remember vividly bantam year so our kids were 14 years, 14 and uh, 13 and 14. And Johnny showed up for second year Bantam. And when he walked up to me, he was the same. He was looking eye to eye to me. And, and I'm looking at him going, holy crap. What, what happened? happened? Going, right? yeah. So then my strategy was I'm taking him from the crease and I'm putting him out to the top so that and that's when the magic happened. Like that kid could fire slow, slow ball, pick the top corner. The ball was like, like the snails, oh, yeah. but accurate, deadly. Like he, and, but then he put, he put some snot on it and it would screw up the goaltender. So he was becoming um, just a phenomenon at, at 13 years old. We could see it. And, uh, I think I mentioned uh, Ryan, like when, when Johnny was little, he showed up to practice with, um, and he handed me this piece of paper. It's almost like, please, sir, can I have more? So he hands me this paper and I'm looking at it and there, there are plays. There's like five plays 
on this sheet of paper and he's like oh, nine yeah. years old and he's written it all up and i always uh, when, when something like this happens i always engage with the player instead mm. of saying hey hey just get on the floor and do that no i didn't i would actually take a knee get down to his height and i'd look at the uh i'd look at the plays and go you actually made these he goes oh yeah yeah i made that i said i like this one this one really works but you know, you know what i noticed here johnny that the ball always goes to you <laughs> yeah oh, you know, made the ball. Or, that's what he said <laughs> or, so, but you know i I really love the fact that he actually sat down. It's almost like me when I was a drawer. I draw Perry Mason on that. He'd be at home drawing up plays. Thinking it up, got the IQ. It was cool. So I, I had a real connection with them. And, uh, but I always allowed him to tell me his thoughts. I always allowed him to try things because yep. there's nothing really structured in the world, truly, because the world wouldn't change, right? You need to have... You need to allow that. So when I saw a kid doing this, you know, I just uh, I had to give him give him slap. But by the time that we got to midget, which was 15, 16 year olds, he won the MVP in Ontario both years. Wow. So he was 13 years old and 14 years old. So he could have actually remained in midget another two years. But he wound up jumping to junior A at 13 years old. Yeah. 14 years old and uh he won the rookie of the year and i've got his trophy in the basement sorry barb i haven't brought it back that's my <laughs> home. Uh, it's still on my wall and actually when he was at my place last year he saw it on the wall and didn't even want it he just kind of oh, no way. Oh, there it is yeah. <laughs> so, but uh awesome. johnny was um, a really terrific lacrosse player i when i used to take my teams out to tournaments out in vancouver and to calgary and that as we're getting older and you know, you got a lot of dead time and stuff like that. So I brought my camera, like my video camera. And I remember we had a picnic table at the place that we were staying. And I decided to interview all my whole team, just, you know, stand pack questions like what's your name, blah, blah, blah. So I could show it to them years and years later and say, yeah. so what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I'm interviewing Johnny and uh, Ed Follett's on the camera. Uh, so your buddy yeah. on the camera. Yeah. he'll tell you the whole story too so johnny's sitting there and i said johnny what do you want to be when you grow up he's i want to play in the nhl <laughs> and i looked at him and I, said, buddy. <laughs> I said you are the best lacrosse player around do you realize that when you're 17 years old you're going to get scholarship offers full rides going to whatever school you want and you're going to be playing in the NLL with your with your uncle. No, I don't want to play hockey. And I'm looking, I'm going. <laughs> I watched him skate, you know, and I'm going, man, he just doesn't have speed. But everybody, everybody's saying he's fantastic, and I'm going, but I've seen him skate, and I knew that the game of hockey was really changing and ramping up the speed and right. kind of the hook, and then uh, you know, like like fishing for marlin. Right, you, you yeah. get hooked on, and they got to drag the guys down the ice. A guy like Marcel Dion could carry guys, but I didn't think Johnny could do it. So um, uh, I have that tape here, and if I ever dig it up, I will send it to you guys because you yeah, do that. The tape. It's kind of it's pretty funny, but he he was so adamant that uh, hockey was going to be his game, and well, he proved me wrong. I'm, I'm the first guy to say, hey, I. Wisdom, there it is again. So you almost no, talked, you almost talked John Tavares out of being a hockey player. Well, I tried. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I my best shot. Yeah, now yeah. I remember. Uh, I've been following him since uh, his draft year and London Knights, and uh, just it was always the rumor was like he was always a better lacrosse player than he was a hockey player, and I just you know there's nowhere to really find that like besides just some uh, stories. And uh, yeah, it would have been great to see. I remember, and I went and saw the uh, an exhibition game between Toronto and Montreal uh, lacrosse here at Mall One. They were back oh, yeah. in the early 2000s. Yeah. So it's just a Sunday afternoon. Me and my buddy just went there and grabbed a beer and a couple and a plate of fries. And it's great. I, I always watched it on TV. I used to drive with his um, Johnny's mom to, um, not all the time. I mean, 
realistically, over the course of Johnny's junior hockey career, I think I went with Barb maybe four times. And that's his mom. His yeah. mom, uh, I'm going to tell you, she's been his ace in the hole his whole life. The minute he hit the gurney in the hospital, she was his agent. She yeah. really, like, even dealing with me, like her, and, like Barb and I get along great because, A, I had three older sisters. So I kind of knew how to handle situations. <laughs> things went yeah. awry. I was being able to bring it back to center. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you just say, fuck it and walk away. <laughs> you know, so I would have to drive. Not, I, I can't use the word half. I used to drive with Barb, watch the games, come back. But um, then, then he gets traded in his last year to London. And uh, she told me a story. I guess I, I can tell it. It was when uh, Johnny gets to the dressing room in London and he's, he approaches Nazem Kadri, who's wearing number 91. And, tries to make a proposition with him to switch numbers and Cadbury told him to fuck off. So I thought <laughs> that kid, like right away when I heard the story and I heard it from a person I mentioned, how dare that guy? You know, then I thought, yeah, that kid's all right. You know, but <laughs> I went to four of those games watching the London Knights and the star of that game was Nazem Cadbury every game. And I was yeah. like, wow. And that was the same year that Johnny was drafted uh, number one. Yeah. We got number four pick, and it was Nazem Kadri. And I, yeah. I'm the only guy in the bar saying, oh, I think we got the steal of this trade. I think I said, this kid's amazing. Another player that actually did that, in, like I was sent to different places with Hockey News. I had to watch the Detroit Red Wings play four times that year, like once in Montreal, once in Buffalo, once in Detroit, once in Toronto. All four games, Fedorov was the best player. He was the best guy on the yeah. night. Like he, he was like, wow, this like, I, you know, not, I, I've watched a lot of hockey in my life. I mean, I watched, I, I was there on Sunday afternoon watching Bobby Orr. Um, they were shorthanded. He skated around the net, lost his glove, broke out, and Davy Keon's chasing him. And Bobby Orr curls back, curls behind the net, picks up the glove. And then goes again and goes to the other end. <laughs> up, play, and they score at the other end. So I, yeah. I can't remember who scored, but I was sitting there going, wow, how can you do that, man? Like, how does yeah. that work? Like, so, I mean, I've watched Gretzky. I've watched. So you, you get to know, you know, just you get to know the players and um, you, you can you can see the special. Yeah. You know, but um, back to Johnny, I didn't see the special in Johnny until he got reinvented in his skating. Once he got, like, I think it was Barb Underhill broke down a game. I, I'm not sure who did it. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it was Underhill. She's done a lot, and, yeah. And the, the one thing I always, one thing about me, it sounds like I'm throwing Johnny under the bus, but I'm not because I was Johnny's biggest fan. I was, anytime I heard somebody diss him, I'd say, hey, let me tell you something. You know, yeah, yeah. You don't think he can skate? I'll tell you right now, he'll be in a he'll be in a hockey school at 27 years old skating. That's how dedicated that guy is. So when he had his game, his skating broken down to to just right back to infancy, and they broke down his his whole skating. And um, I can still remember my son. My son played lacrosse with Johnny all the way up. So Johnny and uh, my son Dylan are are buddies. So we're in the end zone behind the net and Johnny's playing for the Islanders and he broke through the defense, Morgan Riley and uh, Dion Phaneuf. Uh, Phaneuf, okay, you know what? Yeah, but uh, Morgan Riley, you, you don't get around Morgan Riley unless you're no. Connor David, but that's another story. But Johnny broke the defense and went through and I, I'll tell you, my son and I both went, did you, did you see that? Like we looked at each other and go, holy fuck. That guy, hey, holy smokes, we were yeah. so excited. Yeah. And actually, when I watch him play, he's just like a big deal. He reminds me of a friendly Messier. Like when you watch him skate, he skates like Messier, and he's an opportunist, but he doesn't have that gnarliness. He's just all about the business, right? That's right, yeah. I've never had a fight. Oh, maybe. I looked that up the other day. Uh, who was that, Ron? 
I can't remember. You looked it up. But only in one well. fight, yeah, but some... and somebody else that doesn't fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I was a big fan of Tavares. I mean, it's all business. And uh, but he, he just went and, and he just went and reinvented his game again. I guess in the off season. I mean, that's what makes him great. He can keep changing and doing it at a high level of output. So, so, so Johnny and I, uh, you know, over the years, we, we talked about me doing a painting of it. And uh, I knew that when he uh, left the Islanders, I just didn't feel, I didn't feel seeing him in an Islander uniform really inspired me to say, yeah, yeah, I'll do a painting and we'll sell prints. But when right. he got traded to Toronto, that's when the wheels started getting in motion, and uh, I contacted Johnny and said, "I think it's time. Let's let's do something. Let's let's get this thing happening." So um, we had to put some ducks in a row. We had to make sure his agent was cool with it, which was fine. Oh, if Johnny says I want to do this, Johnny gets to do it, right? But yeah. then we had to link up with uh, um, not the NHL, but we hooked up with uh, Brian Aaron with the Frameworths because he was actually selling all of uh, Tavares' stuff out of there. And one thing about Johnny is that he's had a lot of opportunities to go elsewhere, but he's always remained loyal to, uh, that's what he is. He's just a loyal guy. You know, if you got him on your team, he's with you through and through. And um, so no matter what, if this deal was going to go down, it had to basically be approved by Brian Aaron. So uh, we opened the door there and Brian was saying, yeah, yeah, but uh, let me just tell you that art doesn't sell. Just so you know, it's pictures and whatever, but art doesn't sell. And so I said, well, we want to do 91 prints. If we do 91 prints, it won't, uh, it won't be that uh, devastating if we don't sell it. So right. I, uh, so Johnny and I uh, did the agreement and uh, I did the painting. I, I sent a video. I guess you guys have seen it. I don't know how you guys are going to roll it out, but uh, it shows the painting. And I decided to paint him on real maple leaves, like bed, mm -hmm. bed of maple leaves. And he, uh, because he's Canadian, he's Toronto, Toronto maple leaves, leaves. It makes sense. Oh, it's great. I, I got to tell you, painting on leaves is very um, tedious. Because I like that things fall into crevices and it's it's a bitch man it's really hard um but what i did do is i also snuck in a real oak leaf because we're from oakville but i didn't tell him and i hid it in the painting and actually you can actually see it um in the painting if you oh, okay because what happened was i did the painting and johnny came to my house and i had it set up on an e easel and uh he was like, holy shit, man, this is crazy. Like, he loved it. It was, yeah. but uh, um, I told him, I said, there's, a, there's an oak leaf in there hidden in that painting. So if you look at the painting up close, it is nothing but, it looks like if you, you know, when you see uh, Mount Everest, it looks just like a mountain. But when you get there, you see every rock and every nook and cranny, right? Well, that's what, when you get up to these paintings, they look, they look nutty. I, I did one of the, uh, Gord Downing. Right? Gord. So it was one of my favorites. Yes, these are all this whole area was leaves. And these leaves, because he had passed away, I wanted the leaves kind of to leave in the paint. Yes. And uh, but it's amazing. All through here, it's it, it's a tough go through the painting. But I love doing it because because Gord Downey is my kind of Canadian. Even yeah. the Bruins fan, uh, I'll forgive him. But yeah, he he is uh, what, what Canada is about. So I love doing paintings of guys that are, you know, real Canadian. Like, I mean, um, for example, I had Matt Sundin ask me if I could paint him some maple leaves in Swedish uniforms. And I went, no. no. And he said, why? Because it's Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> <Like, laughs> <it> Work out. <laughs> I'll me a Swedish maple and I'll do it. Yeah, Swedish maple. So anyways, <laughs> Yeah, Johnny, actually, it took him about eight minutes. And actually, the film crew that was there filming it filmed him going through the process of going through each corner of the paint. But he found it. He yeah. Found it. So, 
That's amazing. You can't see it. Like uh, the naked eye just will never pick that up on a good day, but you can actually see it on the print. So anyways, this is um, just like August 28th. And there were rumors that uh, Johnny and um, uh, Matthews were um, up for the captaincy. So at that point in time, I was convinced it was going to be Matthews because they had the contract looming and they wanted to keep that kid happy. And, you know, I, Johnny doesn't matter if he's got an A or a P on his sweater. He doesn't give a shit. He, right. wants, he wants just to better the team. That's just the way he is. He's happy to be on the team. So it really didn't come up. And then uh, Matthews got caught dropping his pants. Right, yeah. That security guard. And I all of a sudden I went. So I get on the phone with Johnny. And I say, you know what? And I'd already got the prints made because Johnny yeah. and I were supposed to get together and I had 91 prints. And trust me, that's 15 bucks a print. Like because of the paper, it's on a high, high watercolor paper. It's really good water paper. A special and ink, yeah. Yeah. So um, I told him, I said, do you think that, yeah, he said, oh, I can't say anything. Now, I always, <laughs> I always do that. I just, always, I love it. I was well worded, and, you know. I, I go, so, I, so I really don't know, and uh, you know, we're about to have the baby and everything, and yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was sitting there, oh, shit, man. Then, then all of a sudden, the announcement came out that Johnny was going to be the cap, and then somebody tipped my hand too, and I went, oh, shoot, day, because ninety-one prints times fifteen dollars, guys. I don't know. You do the math. That's that's a few. Bucks. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, I knew I had to go to Brian Airworth and say, you know what, we're we we're, we we're pooched here. We got 91 prints with the letter A on his jersey. We're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to change the painting and get it scanned and get new prints made. So all of a sudden, our bit budget went from eh, to. Mm -hmm. But this is what I did say. I said the only way that I think that we're gonna be able to recoup our loss on. And I, 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 I said this to Johnny, I said, if we can go to 191 prints, we'll recoup whatever we lost on your initial there. Right. Johnny goes, well, okay, we'll sign on. Rumble it up. It didn't matter then. Because all of his proceeds were going to go to his charity anyway. So it was just right. another 45 minutes sitting at his mom's table and rattling off. And then it only took 45 minutes. Less than that, actually. But we had a good time doing it. But yeah. Johnny, uh, I had to go out and get them printed and uh, met up with him at, at his mom's and we got the prints signed. And uh, and uh, some people thought it was a shitty painting because they didn't get the fact that it was painted on leaves. But uh, you know what? It, art is all, you know, you either like it or you don't, right? That's just um, what it is. That's a beautiful picture. I've, I've looked at it. Uh, I was looking at it ever since yesterday evening. And I've looked at it a few times since. It's uh, yeah, it's really nice. I think there's a couple of it you is. here that are waiting for one. <laughs> yeah, I know yes, a couple of guys. Are you, both yeah. Of you? <laughs> I thank you very much because uh, um, I enjoy even framing it. It's fun to, to frame those pieces. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get you to paint over my A on this. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Get you to paint oh, over that one for me. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, this happened last year, or actually last christmas and the things that people don't know about johnny what he does behind the scenes and you know what don't get me wrong i think every hockey player does stuff behind the scenes they right. they help people and they don't want they don't want any publicity but we had an incident up here in ontario um just north of us about 20 minute drive is a town called milton and these kids were on this sheet of ice and they were nine, uh, 11 years old, and mm. they both went through. But one kid got out of the water, tried to save his other buddy, but his buddy drowned. And it was uh, devastating for the hockey world around here. I'm not sure if um, Newfoundland heard about it, but it was a pretty crushing story up here. And one of my friends who lives in Milton called me one night and said, you know, uh, the kid that survived, his biggest hero in the world is John Tavares. Do you think he can some yeah you know and I've, I've got his direct phone number and i've got his i never phone him i always send him an email I, what what, what did you say that what did you say that was again 
<laughs> Send that one over. So I, I said, let me look after it. And it was kind of funny because I had a, I already had a signed John Tavares um, jersey in my studio just over there. And uh, it was just laying there. And I was going to get it framed, but I just never thought anything of it. But when this whole thing went down, uh, I said, this is what my plan was. I said, I'm going to bring the jersey to my buddy to give to the parents of the boy. And we're going to arrange one of these Zoom things with the little boy and John. But the little boy did not know this was going down. He got sat down at a table and all of a sudden John Tavares appeared on the, the screen in front of him. So there's John Tavares talking to this kid for like 15 minutes, asking him where he went to school and how he was and how much of a hero he was. Like it was really touching. I've got the video, but I can't get it public for some reason. I wish people could see it, but it was you know, right to the heart. And yeah. then he says, listen, I've got you something. Um, your mom's got it in a bag. I'd like your mom to give it to, oh, you should have seen the kid. Pretty amazing. I still get emotional watching it, but yeah, Johnny was a beauty there. And, and, and so are you. Give it up that's, your a, that's a hero right there. That's the, these hockey players. They real. They don't realize. You know, you you diss on a kid when he's nine years old, like Clarkson. Clarkson thought some some guy was an asshole. Well, I know Shanahan didn't like um, Ricky Vi because Ricky. Oh, okay. Vibe, so when Shanahan was a rookie in the NHL with New Jersey, he, he dropped the gloves and put some pudding on the vibe and vibes going, what's going on? He says, well, you're an asshole yeah. when he was 14 at a hockey camp. So yeah. these kids, <laughs> you, you remember, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, even they're story. idolized. So I'm, I'm four years old. I got three older sisters. I had no clue about hockey. I didn't know anything about hockey. All of a sudden, my parents are saying, Johnny Bauer's coming. Oh, yeah. As we, my parents were breeding beagles. So we had all these beagles in the backyard and they had a litter and there's like 14 pups and everything. But this Johnny Bowers coming in, my parents are all excited. I'm going, who's just, who's Johnny Bauer? You know, I'm yeah. lining up on our driveway on the street. And I'm going, hey. what, what is this? Is he like Santa Claus or something? So <laughs> he shows up and uh, he's, a, he's a Toronto Maple Leafs goaltender. I'm like, yeah what is it? so that i had to be versed on what hockey was so because the the dogs were in the back and it was nine o'clock at night uh, johnny had his uh he had his own flashlight and he uh goes down to the backyard and picks his he picks a dog right out of the litter it was a, a runt and he called it big john and uh actually big john was in the last stanley cup uh, on the ice with um Johnny Bauer and Johnny Bauer's son. No way. Yeah, that's how the story. But anyways, so I'm four years old. Johnny Bauer, my mom, this is what my mom did. She had everybody that was on the street. It, it looked like um, di like distancing that you see with uh, at, at, at Costco. You know, everybody's got the mask. But my mom had everybody distanced so they would march through the kitchen, through the hallway, out the back door. It was like she just had a snake going through the house. But you know, all the No way. And Johnny sat there and signed everything. It was really, that's when I was going, ah, that's cool. Well, guess what? He leaves, leaves with Big John, and I find his yellow flashlight. And that was the start of my own little memorabilia collection. I just, oh, no way. I got, I got his flashlight. I remember I, I it, it actually worked for two years as a kid. And if you're a kid, you're getting a lot of use out of it. But I, I love that flashlight, especially. <laughs> yeah. But so let's roll the clock forward. I'm I'm hired to do a painting of uh, it was titled Seven Decades. It was the last year that Maple Leaf Gardens was in, in going to be used by the Toronto Maple Leafs. So 1931 yeah. till 1999 was um, the Toronto Maple Leafs in the gardens. So my theme was to select one player from each generation. So in increments of 1931 to 40, 40 to 50. So I picked Red Horner because he was alive. He was 94 at the time, but he was alive. And oh. uh, then I picked uh, Teeter Kennedy 
in the 40s. I picked Howie Meeker in the 50s, uh, uh, Johnny Bauer in the 60s, Sittler in the 70s, Ricky Vive in the 80s, and Curtis Joseph, he was the most popular actor. Because Wendell and I had cool. worked together in the past that I didn't even have <laughs> right. to approach him. Have, but Curtis Joseph was the hottest guy in town when he was there. So I did this painting. I literally got flown down by Air Canada to Naples, Florida. I had to land in Miami and drive across Alligator Alley in a rented car to Naples. I met up with um, Red Horner because he was an old fart and uh, I got to give him credit. He's 94 years old and uh, he still, he still like to have his afternoon. <laughs> yeah. A little nip. He said, look, I don't want you sitting here and talking to me all night. He says, it's enough for me to sign these prints. He says, come and pick them up in the morning. So I had to go back to my, I had to rent a motel room because I had no plans of staying there because my next objective was to get back to Canada and head somewhere else. But I had to spend the night in Naples in a motel. And then I went back to, to pick them up at 10 in the morning. They were all signed. And then I got back to Miami, flew back to Toronto, jumped on a plane to Vancouver where Howie Meeker had just got married to his new bride. I think he was in his, I think he was in 79, 80 at that time. And uh, they were heading to uh, uh, New Zealand for a, uh, honeymoon so they're at the airport in one of those guest rooms where they're waiting for me so i get off the plane i walk right in the room i got the prince hey hi gordy hi golly whiz all that stuff. <laughs> sit everything down and he starts writing but as he's writing he likes to talk so we were really really interacting it was great and you know i was a, a minor coach i was coaching rep in oakville and um so i i had a lot of interesting things to tell him and uh, questions to ask him as he, as he was signing away. And he just stopped his pencil and said, what are you doing this summer in August? I'm going, why? He says, why don't you bring your kid out to BC and I'll put you on my staff and you can uh, be in my cap for se seven days and you can see how I do for you. And so I'm, cool. Oh, I think I'll take you up on that. Then I, uh, then in between that, I get a call from a book publisher asking me to do an artwork on, on Howie Meeker. So Howie and I got together again on that because I wound up doing the cover. But that summer, as soon as the cross was over, my son and I were on an airplane to Vancouver. My sister lived in Nanaimo and his camp was in Parksville. So it's like side by each. So we, we camped out at my sister's place and every day we went to the hockey school. But I got to tell you, I, I, I learned, I, I thought I knew the game of hockey until I actually went to his camp. Now he's, he's a big, he's really pro at uh, Soviet. He likes that, that Karatov or Carrot Head. I don't know what his name is. The, the, Tarasov. I think it was Tarasov. He had the book on Tarasov, but the game was broken down um, and, and, and how we make her like, like, I'm not sure you guys weren't born yet, but back in the 1972 series, Howie Meeker predicted that the, hand, the Canadians were going to have their hands full with the Russians. If you guys think that they're just going to um, walk, walk, like let you walk to their net, I got news for you. Those, those Russians, there's for every one Russian, there's two Canadians, right? They're, 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 yeah. They're, you know, so, uh, but Howie Meeker, uh, was actually the uh, color commentator all through that series, but he almost like uh, he was almost like a communist. We thought, holy shit, this guy's what do they call him Pinkos? He's uh, he's he's leading towards them commies. But he always said, well, look what they're doing. Look, yeah, like th that thing where you see in hockey today, where they they break up the ice and then they turn the puck back and then they no. to try to break up the middle. The Russians were doing that in '72. If the play wasn't right, they'd circle back in their end. And with Canadian hockey, we just dump it in, chase it. And that's right, and crash the rub, rub your nose, rub your nose. And that's just the style. But I'm just saying that Howie, Howie would, uh, after, the best parts were when him and I would go back to his place and have a crown royal and shoot the breeze about what happened that day. And, and uh, or 
he would just talk about the things that happened over in his history. And I didn't know that he, he got um, injured in the war. That's the reason why in 1947, he was like 23 years old and he won the Calder Trophy and the runner up was Gordy Howe, who was only 17. I mean, you're thinking, wait a second, but, but because Howie was a bit of a war hero because he got injured and he yeah. took shrapnel in his legs. So it took him two years to recover. So wow. there was things that were going on, like he talked to me about uh, Billy Barocco, which was really fascinating because I'd always heard about Billy Barocco scoring the goal and then going missing on a fishing trip and they didn't find him for 12 years. That was, yeah. but this guy, he, uh, like the way, how he talked to him, he was a real character and he was one of those kind that the coach said, don't do that. He'd do it. He was just one of those yeah. kind of guys, but he just came by it naturally and uh but uh, how he uh how he said that uh the kid was just a hard working kid and um it was unfortunate what happened but how he said i i set him up for the uh winning goal he says that's my moment of glory billy Baroko and me will always go down in history yeah, but yeah. A, a couple of weeks ago I went, this, this is a guy you got to get on your show Already talking to him. If you're if it's Scott you're thinking about, I bet you I'm already talking to him. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, check it out. He's good. Actually, he's going to be here on the weekend. I'm doing some pictures, pictures for him. Mark. Yeah, Mark. Mark. Mark's he's a good dude, and he's got a. It's an incredible display, and yeah. um, how he got it in his home. Like, I mean, he's got a he's got a plane rack in his basement. Yeah, I saw a couple pictures. Just like and. I think I nearly knocked it over twice. I think yeah, I pissed him off a bit, but yeah, I'm a clumsy guy in the in the room. And but the thing was, I got to touch touch stuff that you're not privy to touch. You know, like no. when you go into a museum, you touch something, you get tossed. But he was cool with everything and uh, got to hold uh, his business, like Bill Barocco's business card when he was selling uh, uh, like fridges and stoves. Wasn't a very good salesman. He's a better hockey player, but no. it was a very. It was like this guy, Mark. He's a big, huge Matthews fan. Mm. And he has Matthews stall with all of his all of his equipment in there. He's got like oh no way fifteen jerseys. I may be wrong, but I uh, I mean he's got probably the biggest collection of Toronto I've seen. Now, mm. obviously, I am not a memorabilia guy, so I don't. I can't say I've seen too many places, but that place was, oh my God, it was wall to wall. And we actually got to play table hockey. He had this big bubble hockey there. So, and I brought, you guys remember the band, the Kings? They oh yeah. A song called Switching the Glide. Yeah, uh, I know. A buddy of mine was the guy who wrote that song. His name's John Picard. His nickname is Zero. Uh -huh. As in the song, it says me and Zero. I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to sing this so, feel free to sing man this might yeah. be your big break <laughs> no i talked about wisdom <laughs> but john picard i took john with me and he you know he he really got a jerk his sleeve he even talk driving home but he was just non-stop going wow jesus christ did you see that stuff like everything was just blow away you know like like i'm looking at behind your back there ryan you got a great display of stuff yeah. Now you times that by 20. That's what he's yeah. got. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, he's got a bunch of pictures that are on the wall, but they're dilapidated and falling apart. And he, he thought that that would bring value to the print because it's part of the original. And I said, that looks like shit hanging on your wall. You got to <laughs> So what he's now doing is he's bringing them here. He's going to come down in the basement with me and we're just going to crank them out. He's going to, I'm going to make him, what I call a yard ape, you know, you have a guy in your studio and say, yeah. it's like a grunt, like, uh, oh, go yeah, for go for it. Yeah, so, lucky. Anyway, so he's going to be at my place uh, Saturday, so we're going to bang out some uh, things for him. But that's a guy you'll enjoy it. But yeah. what you're going to need to get is a, a guy with a video camera to show so he can talk to you guys as he's going. Yeah. I, I've been talking to Mark. I met Mark. I mean, I'm not big into memorabilia. What you see behind me is basically outside of a couple other larger pieces that can't fit in the cabinets that's basically my collection but i uh, i've talked to mark i've known mark probably uh, five years just in passing on different different memorabilia groups and whatnot we've chatted a couple of times and i talked to him the day after he pulled out the wreck the bill barocco 
a plane wreck, right? And uh, yep. just just getting his story from that alone is uh, is uh, is worth sharing on a podcast. And forgetting all everything else that he has going on there, so no, he's already agreed to come on the show. Uh, we're going to be doing an episode with him at some point, not during the playoffs because we're all too stressed out. But, uh, yeah. but no, we're we're getting Mark on for sure. He's a, he's a quality guy in his collection. Like I said, for a private collection, second to none. So really looking forward to that. Great, great. That's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, do you remember I was talking about uh, Johnny J- Johnny Bauer? Um, so I had to go to Mississauga to meet up with Donnie to get him to sign, and I think he was like in his late eighties. But what I did was I slipped my uh, my trusty old flashlight in my uh, pocket. And um, when he sat down to sign, I said, do you, uh, do you remember back in 1964 and you had to go to Oakville to pick up big John the dog, the beagle goes, yeah, I got him off uh, uh, McDonald's or McDougal's. And I said, no, McDougal's, it was us. I said, I, I, I was uh, four years old and uh, you picked up Big John. And do you remember sitting in the kitchen with all the kids filing by? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. And I said, do you remember uh, if you left anything behind? He goes, can't think of anything. And I pulled out the yellow thing and I said, here, I'm giving it back to you. So he actually <laughs> took it back. I thought he would sign it and give it back to me. But he didn't. <laughs> he actually, he took it back. On the way home, he's like, I should have saw that. <laughs> <laughs> but Johnny was, he was a good old boy, too. Yeah. He signed everything. That was the problem. You can never, like, if, you, if you're holding a Johnny Bauer right now and you want to sell it, it's not like, uh, it's not like a Mick Jagger signature, right? It's no. Because he signed 50 Man. million. Yeah. Where, yeah, it's like, yeah, Joe Bowen said the same thing about him. He said that he just he would stay there until the last signature was done, and until there's nobody else anywhere. But, but that yeah. that goes back to giving back to the game, the character. Yeah, I feel bad for them too because they always got to be on their A game. You know, like uh, they're eating in a restaurant, they got they're slurping up a spaghetti and a meatball in their mouth, and they got these people yeah. inundating. And I, I think that people are all getting mad at that. You know, like at some point in time, but. They always got to have their A game, but sometimes every now and then you get a guy dropping the ball, like uh, yeah. at the cane, not tipping that cab driver. And I thought that was a funny story. Wasn't it 19 cents or something? Something like that. Over 19 cents, and he showed up to training camp, and somebody had uh, laminated 19 cents in change on all his hockey sticks. <laughs> 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 yeah. There, there might not be truth to that, but I heard. From a yeah, it actually happened. Yeah, I heard something similar to that as well. Um, but yeah, just to say, like uh, when training camp gets here, we don't get to see too much of this pro hockey. Uh, the Leafs had the training camp here a couple of years ago, and uh, yeah, you hear all the stories about like you know they're in town, they're trying to grab a bite to eat, and then everyone's kicking dirt because it's well, like, they were in there, and I was just trying to get an autograph. I'm like, dude, dude's yeah. been signing autographs for I don't know five years straight, like. Like bad news goes around quicker than good news. I mean, it does, yeah. The minute that they are considered an asshole, there's 10 people already thinking they're an asshole. Maybe that's what we should start doing. Maybe we should start getting our guests to tell us who all the assholes are. Because that'll yeah. get it. Like, I mean, yeah. that'll that'll get us some clicks and views, right? The good stories. No one wants to hear that shit. Everyone wants to know who the assholes yeah. are. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so, let's... Let's pair of assholes on DSC, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah. The asshole reports, yeah. When you can't figure out who the asshole on the podcast is, it's it's usually you. Yeah, <laughs> but I've come to learn the hard way. Well, there you have it. That's uh, that's part one of our two part series uh, with Mr. Rob McDonald, quality guy who gives zero shits and has the best stories. Uh, Rob, one of the coolest people I know. So uh, believe it or not, in part two, uh, the stories get even better. If you're able to, uh, for those of you who listen to the audio portion of our podcast, check out the video portion for part two. Um, we'll be flashing up a bunch of Rob's art and he'll be telling us the stories to go along with the, with each piece along the way and the interactions he had with the, uh, with the players and whatnot. So hard to believe, but the stories get even better in part two. So, um, you can check that out on our YouTube channel as well as, uh, you can find it of course on, uh, on Facebook. So, uh, hope you enjoyed part one and, uh, as always hit that subscribe button. Peace out. <laughs>